Opposition. It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Deputy Premier. Durham students have uh, now been out of school for 19 days. That's the uh, longest teacher strike in over 25 years. That's the longest students have been out of a classroom in over 25 years. Deputy Premier, your government has brought this upon itself with a bargaining process that is being described as flawed yep. and dysfunctional. Yep. The onus is on your government to get these students back in the classroom where they belong before they lose their year. Will you do that? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And as I've said many times, we agree that the students need to be back in class. We want the students to be back to class. And I agree, they have been out for a distressingly long time. But we also know that the only way we're going to get them back in class is if we negotiate. We need to have a negotiated settlement. So we are certainly prepared to stay at the table, to be at the table. I know the school board associations are prepared. I would certainly hope that the uh, unions will be uh, prepared to get back to the table because the only way we are going to resolve this is through negotiation, Speaker. We know that uh, I, Answer. We know that we have to get a collective agreement that will Thank end you. the strikes. Supplementary. Back to the uh, Deputy Premier, Mr. Speaker. Students want to be back in the classroom. Teachers want to be back in the classroom. Parents want their children back in the classroom. If the Ontario Labour Relations Board's decision is appealed, high school students may, not, may be out of the classroom for weeks on end. We're hearing that students at one Durham High School have been told to clean out their lockers because they're not expected to be back in the classroom before the end of the school year. Durham College has said that if these students don't graduate by August 22nd, they cannot offer them admission for next year. Wow. Deputy Premier, these students' future, their careers are at very serious risk. Get the deal done, get these students back into the classroom and graduating next month as they should be. Yes, and I, I'm very concerned if that's the information that is being relayed by the party opposite to, uh, to uh, students and their families, because uh, as things have unfolded at the moment, Stop. bless you, Minister. Because my message has been that we fully expect that uh, that the kids will be back in the classroom because we expect to succeed with getting a collective agreement, and that it's very important that what students are doing right now is making sure that whatever work they can do to keep up to their courses, if they have assignments they know, if they have projects that they know will be required for the end of the semester, they should be doing them right now. And in Answer. fact, I know that the. Durham Board, the Rainbow Board, the Peel Board all have internet course resources on their websites. I would encourage students and uh, encourage Thank parents you. to make sure their students go to those websites and they do the Thank you. Final supplementary. Go back to the Acting Premier. The Premier and this Education Minister have made no progress on any of the three boards where the teachers are currently on strike. OSSTF is in a position to call strikes in four more boards, Halton, Lakehead, Waterloo and ottawa Carleton. Thousands more students could be out of the classroom before the end of the school year. Thousands more students could lose their school year entirely and their graduation. Deputy Premier, get the Premier to use those mediation skills she so often talks about, get the parties back to the table and get the job done and the students back in the classroom. Be seated, please. Thank you. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. That's right. Minister? 
I would like to remind the member opposite is I am not at the Durham table, I am not at the Rainbow table, I am not at the PM table. I am at the Central table, and that is where we're working very hard. But I'm really not going to take a lesson from the people who said that they were going to fire 22,700 education workers and teachers. They were asked during the last campaign. Will it need fewer teachers? And their leader said, it does. It will mean fewer teachers in our system. So if that's how they thought they were going to do labor relations, believe me, that wasn't going to get you labor peace. We know that the way to do labor peace Carry on, please. Ah. So, I repeat, we are ready Answer. and willing to negotiate at the central table. I remain committed to that. The Premier remains to committed to that. Yep. Negotiation is the solution. Your question, the member from Simple North. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is also to the Deputy Premier. Uh, Deputy Premier, 60 per cent of Durham College students come from the Durham region. And as you are well aware, Durham grade 12 students have been out of the classroom for four weeks. Uh, their graduation is at risk. Durham College has said they, they can't admit students who haven't graduated by August the 22nd. Deputy Premier, will you promise these students that they will graduate this, this, this year? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, as I've explained before, uh, I've met with Colleges Ontario, I've met with, met with COU, the uh, Council of Ontario Universities, we've met with the application centres, and uh, what we Member from Leeds, is, Grenville. is that... Member from Leeds Grenville, second time. I would have thought you might actually want the information that was helpful to the students and the parents that are out there worrying about this rather than heckling. We have the commitment from the colleges and universities that we will work together because we know that we need to find solutions to make sure that these students can get into the yes, colleges sir. and the universities. Uh, we will certainly work together to make sure that uh, that they that there are uh, that Thank there you. Are solutions. Thank you. Minister, uh, it's about three times now. I, when I stand, you sit down, you do not finish. Your time is up. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Deputy Premier. Uh, 22,000 Durham students are out of the classroom right now, and today is their 19th day. The next week is a constant week, and there will be no question period or accountability. No negotiations or bargaining are taking place. We know, and I think you know now, that Bill 22, the two-tier bargaining, is a complete failure. Minister, we need the dithering to stop. We need leadership. What action do you propose next week that will guarantee that Durham students will be back in the classroom? Minister. M Minister of Education. No, no, no. Minister already has the floor. Minister. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, Member from Renfrew. First off, could, uh, let's just follow up on the Durham College. Durham College um, has already announced not a ministry direction, but Durham College has actually already announced uh, to Durham students that Durham will be accepting students based on the midterm remark mark right. that we're already submitting. So, in fact, the issue that has been raised by the member opposite, in fact, Durham College has the already from made the decision that they will accept the midterm marks, and there is absolutely no problem. One of the things that we have. The member from Stormont, second time. One of the things. Yes, sir. One of the things that we've noticed is parents being uncertain about putting down deposits. I want to encourage Thank parents you. to get. Final supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's back to the Deputy Premier, I guess, through the Minister of Education. With 72,000 secondary students out of the classrooms, you continually finger point the problem at someone else. The two tiered bargaining system simply is not working. We, we all know that. 
Every, and all sides know that. It is a failure, and the victims now are the 72,000 students. It is your Bill 122, it is your two-tiered system that is putting the education system uh, in chaos. Being mystified or perplexed is not enough. We need leadership, not dithering. Will you promise that the 72,000 students that they will graduate and not, let, left, let, not be left disadvantaged when they attend college or university this coming fall? Thank you. Minister? Yes, thank you. I think we need to go back and think about how we arrived at Bill 122. Uh, the, we, we negotiated, we consulted, we talked to all four member from Prince Edward Hastings. We talked to the directors, we talked to all the unions, and we went through this process of drafting and consulting and redrafting and consulting. And through all that process, of working with all the partners that are concerned with collective bargaining in the education sector, this party remained obstinately opposed to having any part in that negotiation, in that discussion, in that consultation. They just kept saying no, 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 no. Well, I'm really not surprised that the member doesn't Answer. like the legislation. They all voted against it in the first place. Thank you. There already are three people very close. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Acting Premier. History is being made in Ontario today. Ontario's independent watchdogs have written to the Premier saying that her Hydro One sell-off is unacceptable and undemocratic. Mm. That's historic. And it shows just how arrogant this government has become. The Auditor General, the Ombudsman, the Financial Accountability Officer, the Privacy Commissioner, the Integrity Commissioner, and the French Language Services Commissioner all, all are calling on the provincial government to reverse plans in the budget bill. Will the Liberals listen to Ontario's nonpartisan? Independent officers and reverse their plan to sell off Hydro One. Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, and I, I have to say we welcome the, the dialogue that's happening across this province about our plan to uh, build more infrastructure and broaden the ownership of Hydro One. Let me be clear: publicly traded companies have different oversight mechanisms than provincially owned assets. But there are still oversight mechanisms. And Thank you. Finish, please. And I, I have to say, Speaker, that this was a decision we did not come to lightly. We, we have Member very from carefully Timmons, weighed Bates. the public interest, and we are convinced that the public interest is met by retaining uh, regulation of the energy industry, but broadening the ownership Answer. so we can build badly needed The member from Tunes, James Bay, second project. time. That's why we're Thank doing you. this, to build the infrastructure. Thank you. Supplementary. This government is becoming more undemocratic by the day. And Ontario's non-partisan, independent watchdogs are calling the government out. The Liberals have made it clear they don't respect our independent officers. Well, I can tell you that new Democrats do respect Minister them. Of Economic Development. These officers, Speaker, have legislated authority to hold government and provincial agencies and corporations accountable. Why are the Liberals taking a page of out of the Stephen Harper playbook time. by shutting down our independent officers and slamming the door on democracy and accountability? Well, the Speaker, just a, a, a reminder to the leader of the third party about our commitment. The member from Timmins, James Bay, is warned. Carry on. 
Speaker, our commitment to independent officers of the Legislature is stronger than any government in recent memory. Speaker. Let's just review. We actually created the new financial accountability officer. We created the provincial advocate. The member from Welland, come to order. We made the French language services commissioner independent. We expanded the ombudsman role to include municipalities, school boards, and publicly funded universities. Speaker. The integrity commissioner now has strengthened oversight of lobbyist rules and government expenses. New, tougher rules for the Answer. Information Privacy Commissioner when it comes to offences. Speaker, we are the party that has expanded the number of independent officers Thank and you. expanded the. Thank you. Supplementary. Dogs are independent, and they are non-partisan. Speaker, their job is to tell the hard truth, no matter what party is in power. The Liberals are trying to muzzle those watchdogs because they want to keep the Hydro One sell-off and the Hydro One going forward secret and under wraps, so that the people of this province have no idea what the heck is going on in that corporation. Until Stop the clock. The Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure is warned. Carry on, please. Ontarians deserve accountability, Speaker. Ontarians deserve transparency in their most important utility. Will the Liberals stop trying to muzzle the Auditor General, the Ombudsman, the Financial Accountability Officer, the Privacy Commissioner, the Integrity Commissioner, and the French Languages Services Commissioner, and stop? the sell-off of Hydro One today. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, Speaker, I don't think anybody's trying to muzzle anyone. The, uh, the independent officers of the legislature have indicated their thoughts, Speaker, and we welcome that. We are also delighted, Speaker, that uh, Denis Desautel, the former Auditor General of Canada, has, uh, has now uh, indicated that he will ensure fairness throughout the, the IPO process, Speaker. That is a very important role, and we are delighted that uh, Denis Desautel has agreed to take on this important responsibility because we agree with the third party. We agree that Ontarians demand that there be oversight and that there be a fair and transparent process. So, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the member opposite has been uh, talking about the impact on rates. The, they also full, know, full well know that the rates have always Answer. been and will continue to be set by the Ontario Energy Board. Speaker, it's uh, thank you. It, thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Also for the acting premier, Speaker, or the deputy premier. Not only is this government muzzling the independent officers of the House, Speaker, they're also muzzling Ontarians. Ontarians have less than five hours to get their names on the list to have their say on Hydro One for only four meagre days of hearing, Speaker, here in Toronto. We've seen tens of thousands of people, of all political stripes, people, uh, Speaker, from all walks of life, who are wanting to send the Liberals a message that they don't want to have to pay for the Liberals' uh, sell-off of Hydro One. They don't want to be the ones left paying the price for this wrong decision. So the question is, why are the Liberals shutting out the people of, Toronto, of Ontario who actually own Hydro One? Why are they not allowing hearings to happen around this province? Question. Why are they muzzling Ontarians? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. House Leader. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and I'm going to uh, disagree with the premise of the question uh, that is posed by the, the leader of the third party. Uh, in fact, Speaker, what we're doing is we are enhancing uh, uh, the, the public's input into our budget process by ensuring that Kitchener, there is Waterloo. six days of committee consideration, uh, Speaker, uh, into, into the budget by holding, uh, by holding hearings at Queen's Park. Speaker, the member opposite knows that these six days are uh, three times more than the number of days that have been used by all three political parties who have been in government over the last 25 years in this province when it comes to the consideration of the budget. In fact, I remind the member opposite when, when her party was in government, uh, in two out of uh, four budgets they table, they only allowed one day each speaker for budget consideration. And for the last two budgets Answer. in 1993 and 1994, speaker, they allowed for zero days of budget con consideration when Thank they you. were discussing things. Thanks, social contract. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Speaker, the Premier knows that there are people from London, from Etobicoke, from Peel, from Sudbury, from Thunder Bay, from Oakville, from Barrie, from Cambridge, from communities across this province, Speaker, who don't want to pay the price for the Hydro One sell-off. They can't afford higher hydro bills. Every Liberal MPP knows this because they've been getting those emails, Speaker. Tens of thousands of people. Are Liberal backbenchers going to go back home to their constituencies next week to their ridings and tell their constituents why it is that they are going to be the ones who are going to pay the price for this hydro sell-off, and yet they have no interest whatsoever in hearing their opinion or what they have to say? Well, Speaker, I can tell you what our constituents are talking about. Our constituents are talking about the need for, pub uh, for public infrastructure in our communities. What our constituents want is to, is to put an end to uh, gridlock and congestion on, on, our, on our highways so that they can get to, to work in an, in, a, in an expedient way and home at a, at a timely fashion so they can spend time with their families. And, Speaker, what the only thing that the NDP is trying to do is block that kind of progress because we need to pass this budget speaker in order uh, to have programs uh, that will help fund our infrastructure to reduce our auto rates and of course speaker to in ensure that we have retirement in uh, income security through new pension plan what NDP is, is suggesting to, to the leader of the third party is nothing but stalling tactics Answer. they do not want progress that will help uh, uh, ease the life uh, lives of, of Ontarians uh, by making uh, by ensuring that this bu budget does not pass. Supplementary, a final Speaker, supplementary. Families and businesses cannot afford to pay the price for the premier's wrong-headed sell-off of Hydro One. But Ontarians have less than five hours, Speaker, to get their names on the list to be heard at the public hearings. So they can call 416. 325 3526, uh, or they can email kkoch at ola.org to get on the list and tell the Liberals what they think of Hydro One. The number again 416 325 3526, or kkoch at ola.org. The Premier is trying to shut people down, Speaker. She's hunkering down. Sorry, stop the clock. Stop the clock. Please finish. She's hunkering down here in Toronto, Speaker, making it as difficult as she possibly can for the people outside of Toronto to be heard Question. in this process. When will the Premier, when will the Liberal government start listening to the people of this province, the people across Ontario, and stop this wrong-headed sell-off of Hydro One? Speaker, we are listening to Ontarians, and Ontarians are telling us every single day, and not only us, but all members of this legislature, that they Member want from Windsor to us come to see. invest in our infrastructure. They want us to build Member from good Hamilton roads Mountain. and bridges in our communities. They want us to make sure that we have good public transit and transportation. Speaker, there is no more time for inaction when it comes to building a 21st century infrastructure in the province of Ontario. And the only thing NDP is interested in, the only thing the NDP, wa NDP wants to do is block this budget so those investments are not made in our communities. That is unacceptable, Speaker. We want this budget passed Answer. so that not, not only we build a critical infrastructure in our communities across the province, but also reduce our auto premium rates and also ensure Thank that you. we have retirement income security for Ontarians. Thank you. New question. The member from Mississippi. My question is for the Deputy Premier. As we begin to celebrate uh, Nursing Week in Ontario, there are more than a thousand nurses who are not celebrating. You are firing nurses at hospitals right across the province. We all here in this house have examples. In my hometown of North Bay, you have fired 94 full-time health care workers, including 54 RPNs, and you fired 34 part-time workers, including 14 RPNs. Tomorrow, I'm at our hospital's Take Your MPP to Work event. Deputy, what should I tell the remaining nurses who fear you'll be firing them next? Health and long-term care. Minister of Health and long-term care. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And one of the things you can tell them is that there are 24,000 more nurses working in this province than were working here 10 years ago. And in fact, you can also tell them that more than 3,500 nurses were added in 2013 and a similar number in 2014, Mr. Speaker. You can tell them that nurses working full-time. We've worked hard to increase the proportion of nurses working full-time in, in the past decade. We've increased the percentage of nurses in this province working full-time by 14 percent. You can tell them, Mr. Speaker, that we've had more than 18,000 new nursing graduates go through our nursing graduate guarantee, getting them that first experience yeah. in the workplace. You can tell them the late career nursing initiative. More than 20,000 experienced nurses have been provided with the opportunity to benefit from that program and work in less physically demanding circumstances Thank in you. hospital and other environments, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Deputy, nobody believes any of your numbers you ever tell us. You're the same people that told us the gas plant cancellation would cost $40 million. Uh, someone's edgy. I'm standing. Please finish. Thank you. These are the same people that said the gas plant scandal would cost $40 million when it's over a billion dollars. You say you're hiring nurses, but you're actually firing nurses. In New Liskert, 18,000 hours of nursing care cut. In Timmins, 40 frontline health care workers fired. In the Sioux, 12,000. Minister of Transportation, second time. No, you were too busy heckling to hear me say it the first time. Please finish. Uh, in the Sioux, 12,500 hours of nursing care gone. All the pen be uh, beds in Penetanguishene Hospital closed. Quinty lost 58 RNs. Cuts in Scarborough, Petrolia, Stratford, Seaford, Clinton. The list goes on. Deputy, why do you continue to say one thing when the exact opposite is the truth? Mr. Well, Mr. Speaker, I find it unbelievable that the party opposite, the member opposite, is speaking this way because the way that they chose, would have chosen to get to balance is by firing thousands of health care workers and thousands of nurses across this province. And I find it unbelievable to hear this coming from a party that referred to our nurses as obsolete hula hoops, Mr. Speaker. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Finish, please. So a party that referred to our professional nurses around this province as obsolete hula hoops. We know that your plan to get back to balance was to cut 100,000 jobs. We know many of those jobs would have come from our nurses. In fact, yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I had the privilege of announcing changes to home and community care across this province, which includes substantial new investment in nurses and nursing hours to benefit people living in the home and community environment. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. My question is to the Deputy Premier Speaker. Hundreds of teachers are rallied outside. Actually, thousands and thousands of teachers are rallied outside today to tell the government to stop sitting on the sidelines of negotiations. Tens of thousands of students are out of Remember class and East wondering York. if the school year is lost. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been cut from our already underfunded education system. Our schools have been thrown into chaos, Speaker. Contrary to Liberal spin, Ontarians know that the government holds ultimate responsibility over education in this province. Why is this Liberal government forcing students and families to pay the price for their reckless cuts and their neglect on the education file? Thank you. Thank you, Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. I'm not sure what school system you're talking about, but the one I want to talk about is the one where uh, we've made major investments in our school system. You know, they keep saying that we've cut special education. I'd like to tell you something about special education funding, Speaker. Let's, let's have a little bit of actual information. 
We have increased special education spending by $1.1 billion, wow. up to $2.72 billion. Wow. That wrong? is a 68 per cent increase in special education spending. Do you know how much that is in comparison to the cost of living? That's about triple the increase in the Answer. cost of living speaker. So I'm not going to take any lessons from these people who actually campaigned, Thank campaigned you. on Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, instead of lighting a fire under negotiations, the Premier and our government are playing the blame game. Blame the teachers, blame the school boards, but never admitting that their government is failing families across this province. The Minister of Education is sitting on the sidelines. This minister sitting on the sidelines and doing nothing while the process is being circumvented. Speaker, will the Deputy Premier and her government stop actually sitting on the sidelines and get up and start making sure that students get back into the classroom where they belong? Thank you, Minister. I really would like to know exactly what it is she's proposing. Yeah. However, what I can say, two things. Number one, we are at the table, we are at the central table willing to negotiate with any of our partners who would like to be there. But what I would like to also talk about, because she says we keep saying we've got the education system in chaos. I talked to you about the special education funding. One of the things we've been able to do with that special education funding speaker is actually look at what is it that our special education no, students are able to achieve? And do you know, when we use the EQAO results to track our special education students, we find that the grade three writing Answer. scores for our grade three special education students have gone up 39 per cent. What that tells me Thank you. is that the. Thank you. New question. The member from. Stop the clock, please. No, start the clock. I'm going to warn the minister. It's been three, four times now where I stand and you continue. You're warned. The member from Renfrew, come to order. Second time. New question, the member from Ottawa or Leeds. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Children and Youth in Care Day, an opportunity to recognize the resilience and strength, strength demonstrated by young people in the care of the province. As someone who began her career as a social worker working at the Children's Aid Society, I understand that the most important action we can take for children and especially youth in the care of the province is to give them a strong foundation for a bright future. We know that the most important action that we can do for children, and especially youth that are taken care of by the province, is to give them good basis for a better future. This special day, can the government inform this House on ways in which we, they are continuing to help youth who have, come who have been in care reach their full potential? Thank you. The children and youth service. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to uh, acknowledge the MPP from Otta, Ottawa Orleans for her question and the work she's done Very in child strong. welfare. Very Thank strong. you so much. And uh, I just want to add to Speaker, a number of us this morning were at a celebration, a celebration of uh, Youth in Care Day with our provincial advocate and the foundation of the Children's Aid Society. I was there with both my critics and uh, MPP Wong as well, who actually put forth uh, the motions, the private member business, to create uh, Children in Care Day. And, Speaker, we know that by supporting youth leaving care of the province during their late teens and their 20s, we're focusing on their education and well-being. We um, have a lot of uh, new programs and services to help youth transitioning Answer. into adulthood, and we've increased the minimum financial support for these youth to $850 a month, Speaker. We know there's Thank more you. to do, but we want— Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for her answer. 
Department is, is taking the voices of youth and children in care into account and helping them transition into adulthood. The foundation of success is, of sex is education, and it is therefore crucial to make sure youth leaving care can access the programs and training they need. Mr. Speaker, could the government highlight some of the ways it is helping youth leaving care get the education they need to lead successful adult lives? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Our government is focusing on ensuring that youth transitioning from care get a great opportunity for education and success. So we provide $2,000 a semester, Speaker, to youth formerly in care who enrolled in OSAP eligible post-secondary training programs. <coughs> Excuse me. We also cover up to 50% of tuition for more young people thanks to expanded grant eligibility. And we partner with 30 post-secondary educational institutions to cover full tuition, full tuition for Crown Wards in Ontario and youth formerly in care. Speaker, we know that education is the key to a prosperous future for all young people, so we'll continue to make education services and programs accessible for all youth, and particularly the youth who are leaving our care. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Dufferin Calvary. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Minister, do the justices of the peace that you appoint have to have or have a code of conduct that they are expected to follow? Thank you. Attorney General. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The peace, uh, the uh, justice, uh, the judges have a code of conduct to follow, and uh, uh, and they are uh, owed to the highest uh, uh, manner, uh, discipline that uh, you know the uh, the title called for or the position called for. Thank you. Supplementary. So I would suggest to you it needs updating. Your Premier posted on Twitter whether or not it's caught on film, sexual harassment at work is no joke. We agree. Yeah. Hydro One fired Sean Simone less than a day after he made sexual comments to Sean Hunt. So why did it take you five years, two separate convictions, multiple women having to come forward on sexual harassment for you to fire Errol Messiah as a Justice of the Peace? Be seated, please. Thank you. I, uh, no, I'm, I'm getting quiet. Attorney General. As I said, Mr. Speaker, uh, the uh, you know the justice of the peace are all to uh, a very important level of uh, discipline. Member from Dufferin Caledon. And uh, the uh, and if people have a concern about what they're doing, they should uh, they should. Put a complaint against them. There is a, there is a, a committee that is a very independent from the government that review the uh, the situation and then uh, bring about recommendation for the action that we should. Uh, the should member take. from Dufferin Caledon, so, second time. Uh, it's uh, Sir? it's it's very important that public knows that they can they can, uh, they can trust the process. That the process, uh, the review of the discipline Thank of you. the situation is. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My, my question to the Deputy Premier. Today, legal experts released an opinion that says that Liberal plans to sell off Hydro One will end public control of the company. The member from Maitland, Those Lawrence. experts say the budget bill makes it clear, and I quote. Government's true intent is to relinquish control and stewardship of the electricity market. The provision for the purported retention of 40% public ownership is essentially a marketing ploy for legislative reforms that will certainly abandon public control of Hydro One. Does the Deputy Premier think that anyone believes her marketing ploy? Thank you. 
Stephanie Premier. Very, I'm very pleased to, um, to have the opportunity to talk about some of the overnight oversight mechanisms that will be in place, Speaker, when Hydro One becomes a publicly traded company, Speaker. We, uh, we are absolutely committed to doing what is in the public interest. And when it comes to hydro rates, Speaker, the Ontario Energy Board will continue as it does now, will continue in the future to set those rates as it does for other energy companies, Speaker. We are committed to, uh, uh, to selling no more than 60 per cent, Speaker, of the company, and we are ensuring that major decisions made by Hydro One will require a two-thirds vote, giving us de facto control, Speaker, of the, of the company. We will have the ability to uh, to fire the whole board of directors, Speaker, and we will um, and we will nominate 40% uh, uh, of the board of directors. So we are finding that right balance. Thank speaker. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Liberals' marketing ploy on the Hydro One sell-off is all based on keeping a minority 40% stake. But the experts are clear: there is nothing to prevent private investors from outvoting the government. They say, quote, even if a 40 per cent stake is preserved, effective control can shift to the private sector. And those same experts confirm that Ontario could end up with well under 10 per cent, 10 per cent in public hands. The government is trying to sell Hydro One to the bankers, and they're trying to sell Ontarians a pig in a poke. Will the government stop the sell-off today? Thank you. Well, Speaker, we are committing to build the infrastructure that this province so badly needs. Speaker, now the party opposite might think that the third there's party. some uh, other uh, uh, pot of money under the rainbow where we can build the infrastructure. But I tell you, Speaker, on this side, we know that infrastructure costs money, and we, as did the NDP during the last election, the Essex. Uh, are looking carefully at the assets we already have, Speaker, that we can put to better use by building the assets of infrastructure. We're committed to uh, improving the infrastructure in the province. We will use the resources uh, of the people of Ontario, whether it's uh, buildings that we don't need to own, whether it's land we don't need to own, or whether it's a share, a share in high yes, speaker. We're putting our assets to work on the priorities of the people of this province. Thank you. Question, the member from the Tropical Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour. Minister, earlier this week there was a front-page story in the Toronto Star about the rise of temporary work in the GTA and what that means for today's economy, and it's clear from that and other signals that our economy has evolved significantly over the last number of years. I know that, and it's clear that workplaces are having to adapt to this and, and employees are having to adapt um, to, these, to this new economy as well. Uh, Minister, could you share with us what our government is doing to ensure workplace laws keep up, keep up with this evolving economy. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, and thank you to the Honourable Member for that excellent question. Speaker, the government recognises that Ontario's labour relations and employment standards law should keep up with the changing economy. In fact, Speaker, in uh, the mandate letter I received from the Premier last year, the Premier asked that I undertake a review of Ontario's changing workplaces with a view to ensuring that our labour laws and our employment standards do indeed meet the needs of our modern economy. Speaker, in that regard, what we've done is appointed two excellent special advisors, Labour lawyer Michael Mitchell and former Justice John C. Murray, both whom have excellent reputations and some expertise in labour law. The, advi the advisors, Speaker, will conduct broad consultations across the province with respect to the Labour Relations Act, the Employment Standards Act. They're going to consider the findings from these consultations when they make the final recommendations to me. Speaker, I look forward to sharing more about the process as it unfolds in the supplementary. Thank you. <laughs> supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, you mentioned that uh, Justice Murray and Mr. Mitchell will be conducting broad consultations across the province, and I know you announced the, uh, the appointment of the advisors in February, uh, but I'm sure there are many members of the public who are eager to know when and how they can provide input. Uh, workers and employers alike in almost every corner of this province uh, have expressed interest in sharing their thoughts, but as MPPs, we have not yet been able to direct them as to how they can share their perspective. Uh, Minister, could you please give the members of this House and the public an idea of when they can expect those consultations to get underway? 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member. This is something that I, I would hope would be of interest to all members in the, of this House, and I'm asking that they advise the constituents of the information I'm about to give you. We're certainly trying to get it out through social media, on the websites that the Ministry of Labour has, but I'm very pleased to announce that the special advisers will be kicking off their public consultations right here in Toronto on June the 16th. Good news. From Toronto, Speaker, they'll travel to Ottawa, to Mississauga, to Guelph, to Windsor, London, Sudbury, Windsor. Hamilton, and Thunder Bay, and then they'll be returning um, in the summer to Toronto. Members should also know that the groups or individuals, for some reason, cannot make it to a hearing near them to give oral testimony. They can offer written submissions via email to the ministry. Information is available on the ministry's website along with a guide to the consultations. Answer. It's going to outline the process for submissions to all the interested parties. The Changing Workplaces Review will help sure ensure that our employment, labour relations Thank laws you. keep up with the modern economy. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, Member Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, your government is allowing the OPP helicopter base in Sudbury to be shut down. This helicopter has been providing vital search and rescue services for the North, First Nations and the northern part of Perry Sound District since 1991. Sudbury enjoys good weather for flying most of the year, while the Aurelia base is in the snow belt and experiences lake effect weather conditions. Minister, why are you lowering the capabilities of the OPP to support frontline officers and provide search and rescue operations in the North? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for asking this important question. And uh, as the member may recall, I've uh, spoken uh, on this issue before in the House uh, uh, when a question was uh, asked by the member from uh, on Sudbury, who whom I'm working very closely uh, uh, with on this very important issue. I, I want to first start uh, by saying, Speaker, and I'm sure the member opposite knows very well that when it comes to decisions that are operational in nature, like a decision made by the OPP as to where they locate their various assets, that's an operational decision. That's a decision that is made by the OPP. That's a decision that is, of course, taken uh, on behest of uh, the commissioner of, of the OPP. And, and, and there's uh, uh, little of any influence that is exerted uh, by the government. And, and so we need to be mindful uh, of that speaker. Our number one priority speaker is the safety and security of yes, every Ontarian, uh, which is extremely important. We need to make sure that all uh, the, the responsibilities uh, and the mandate that is laid out in the Police Services Act is available. Thank and you. I'll add more in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. And Minister, you're the minister responsible for the OPP. <laughs> minister, just this past Sunday, the Aurelia-based helicopter was called to find two lost hikers in Sudbury. When the emergency call came in, they couldn't fly out because of poor weather. Luckily, the Sudbury-based helicopter that was on duty in the north was able to return before dark to locate the hikers. This case demonstrates how safety standards in the north will be negatively affected by the closure of the Sudbury base. Minister, will you commit to doing whatever you can to ensure an OPP helicopter remains based in the north? Mr. Speaker, again, I, I thank the, the member opposite, and I want to restate that uh, our number one priority is the safety and, and security of every Ontarian. Given, given, Speaker, that the question has been raised about this locally, I have asked my Deputy Minister of Community uh, Safety uh, for more information about this uh, decision. Uh, it is important, Speaker, to have the necessary information about how Sudbury and the North are served by aircraft in search and rescue operations and how this decision may impact uh, service uh, uh, across the north. The OPP speaker are mandated to provide certain police services across the province, including aviation support, and they have a responsibility to, of course, communicate their decisions effectively so that all communities in Ontario get the information they need to feel safe. Speaker, I also want to add that OPP works very closely with the Ministry of yes, Natural Resources and Forestry and continues to use ministry aircraft based in Dryden, Thunder Bay, Timmins, Muskoka and Sudbury. I will Thank continue you. to work closely with the members on this issue. Thank you. Supplementary. The mem uh, no, sorry. New question. The member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Yesterday we learned that more nurses are losing their job. This time it's at CHIO, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. 
Speaker, the government promised that health care would not shoulder the brunt of their austerity agenda. Clearly, though, it's our frontline nurses that are taking the biggest hit. Losing a nurse is never good, Speaker, but losing 27 pediatric nursing positions at CHEO, who cares for some of the sickest children in our province, is just plain wrong. Does this government austerity agenda knows no bound? Speaker, how does the minister feel to be balancing the province budget on the back of some of the sickest children in this province? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, perhaps, you know, perhaps unlike the member opposite, I, I trust the professionals that work in our hospitals. I trust the professionals that work in our LINs that make those difficult decisions so that they can ensure that the highest quality of care is provided to Ontarians wherever they may live, whatever age they might be. And I think that she understands that we're also in an important transitional period because when that announcement was being made yesterday, I was making an announcement which would result in a dramatic increase in the number of nurses yep. working in the home and community there. sector, Mr. Speaker. And so that transition as we're providing care for individuals and their families closer to home in their communities where they want to see that care, where they can be surrounded by their loved ones, where evidence shows that we can care for them effectively, that as that transition yes, takes sir. place, we do need to adjust from time to time in terms of the funding levels uh, and how we deploy our nurses and other Thank health you. professionals around the province, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, 27 full-time equivalent pediatric nursing positions are being cut at CHEO. Since January 2015, ONA has told us that over 400 full-time equivalent nursing positions have been cut, the equivalent of close to 800,000 hours of quality RN care cut. Our most vulnerable des deserve more nursing hours, not less. The scientific evidence is clear for everybody to see. Every nurse being cut out of our hospital put patient care and patient lives at risk. Speaker, this government chose a very, very sad way to ring in nursing week by cutting pediatric nurses at CHEO. My question is simple. How many more nursing positions will be cut from our Ontario hospital? Question. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, the member opposite, she's a health care professional as I am. She understands when a, a, a position in one part of the hospital uh, goes away and emerges in another program in another part of the hospital, that actually re results in the near term in a reduction in one position and that position being added elsewhere in the hospital. It's you net know, and, that and it's that net it's figure net. that matters most. And yeah. I was at CHEO recently making an announcement for a brand new pediatric chronic pain uh, clinic at ah. that hospital that will result no in a significant care. number of new positions. Yeah. And similarly, at the, the Ottawa Hospital, right now, Mr. Speaker, there are, there are active positions for 50 new nurses, 50 RNs, that need to be employed at Ottawa Hospital. So we are making those investments. There yes, is sir. an ebb and flow. I trust our health care professionals in our hospitals, in our LINs, around this province, in Ottawa, to make the right Thank decision you. for our patients. Yeah. New question? The member from Burlington. Merci, Mr. The President. My question is at Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for Ministry, Minister of uh, Correctional and Community Services. For the men and women from across our province whose life-saving actions keep us safe. In my community of Burlington, we are fortunate to be ably served by the women and men of the Halton Region Police Service, whose civilian and sworn officers do an outstanding job in each of Halton's communities. My late husband was a police officer who served 24 years, first with the Toronto Police Service and then the Ontario Provincial Police in seven communities across our province. As a result, I have a special appreciation of the important role that police officers play on the front lines every day. Whether they are delivering education, safety and awareness programs in our schools, attending the scene of a collision, investigating criminal activities or working to prevent serious crime, police officers play a critical role in keeping Ontarians safe. Mr. Speaker, through you. Can the minister please inform the legislature what we are doing this week to honour the work of Ontario's Question. police officers? Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Personal Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Burlington for her question and thank her for her passion for, for public and community safety. 
Um, as she mentioned, she's, uh, she's part of, uh, of the police family, uh, uh, as I am, because my grandfather was, uh, was a police officer, and I, I share her passion uh, with her, and I thank her for advocacy on behalf of community and public safety. Speaker, each and every day we are thankful for the hard work and dedication Ontario's police officers show in keeping our communities safe. Uh, but, Speaker, this week we are especially thankful to the men and women of our police services because it is Police Week in Ontario. And tomorrow is the Peace Officers Memorial Day, which is recognized across the world. So, Speaker, it's my privilege to recognize and thank our police officers, along with all the members of the legislature, for protecting us from harm. The theme of this year's yes, Police Week is Discover Policing. Police services across the province have been promoting the profession of policing to the communities they serve and encouraging the public to learn more about their jobs. Our government is proud Thank of you. the work they do and the partnership we have with our police officers. Thank you, Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your response. Clearly, our police community is a passion that we both share, and I appreciate your commitment to honouring the service of the police officers who work hard to keep our community safe. Since 2003, Ontario's crime rate has dropped by 36 per cent, and Ontario's violent crime rate has dropped by 27 per cent. In fact, Ontario has the lowest crime rate of any province and territory every year since 2004. We owe a great deal of this progress to our police services. As we honour them and as we honour their work during Police Week, it is important to reflect on the work that the government can do to help make Ontario even safer. Moving forward, it is important that we work together to develop solutions that will help to address the root causes of crime and other social issues. Mr. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain how he plans to build even safer communities across Ontario? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, as we dedicate this week to honouring the commitment of our police forces to keep us safe, it is important that we look at ways in which we are working to build even stronger communities across the province. Speaker, we have worked hard to build safer communities. Now we must work smarter to make our communities even safer. Our strategy for a safer Ontario is focused on finding smarter and more effective ways to build safer communities across our great province. We are forming collaborative partnerships that include police and other key sto stakeholders, such as education, mental health, and addiction specialists. This is about bringing more people to the table to address the issues that confront our communities at their root cause. This will ultimately help make our communities safer and our police officers safe as well. Speaker, collaboration and partnership is key in order for us to make yes, decisions sir. around our community safety in a smarter way. I also want to encourage people as we celebrate the, the May 2-4 weekend to be safe and drive safely as well. Thank, Thank you, you, Speaker. Question the member from Huron Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Minister, I invite you to join me to acknowledge local success. Specifically, Minister, the 2014 Provincial Apiarist Annual Report produced by your government says protective measures brought in by the Pest Management Regulatory Agency contributed to a 70 per cent decline of in season bee mortality during the 2014 corn and soybean planting season. Considering the success of actions taken by Ontario farmers and Ontario industry, why won't you listen to reports coming from both Ontario and federal governments, and why are you so intent to rush through regulations that will devastate Ontario farmers? What a good question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. As the, the member may know, we had over a 34 per cent loss uh, in bees this year. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture just reported record losses in the United States of 42 per cent. I just said Ontario. That's where I started. And so maybe just listen to the answer. The second thing, Mr. Speaker, we know that we've got very significant problems, both with wild pollinators, for which we do not have numbers yet for, and we know that this is water-soluble, breaks down, becomes much more toxic, and we're now picking it up in our river streams. Quebec just found it above safe levels in all 20 rivers they studied. So we're applying a precautionary principle because the science is showing very grave dangers to species, to the integrity of our, of our, our ecology, Mr. Speaker, and to and sir, our uh, wa water invertebrates and that. We're taking this very seriously and monitoring the science very carefully. Thank you. Wait, go to your supplementary. Uh, Minister, may I remind you that just last week at a conference you spoke at, 
You said, and I paraphrase, politicians go off the rails when they don't focus on science. That's right. So in that spirit, I'd like to ask you and share with you that the current provincial apiarist report from your government noted that the Ontario honeybee sector is growing and actually ended the 2014 season with a 15% increase in the number of colonies. Considering these significant numbers show that the honey population, honey bee population is growing in Ontario, what is really behind your push to de destabilize the $9 billion Ontario grain sector? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, it was interesting because I've been out uh, going out on Fridays uh, to visit soy and grain farmers. Uh, I was actually in Huron County and in uh, Perth County and Wellington County recently, uh, and and it's been, and it's been quite interesting as I met a number of uh, of grain farmers who share the government's concern. And these were people, actually, Mr. Speaker, who wrote me letters because they were quite upset about it because they'd gotten a lot of disinformation. Farmers are going to continue to use neonics on a limited basis. If they have the pests, they will be able to use it. We're working very closely with our friends at agriculture to put integrated pest management. So we're not banning it and quite far uh, from um, from damage, Mr. Speaker. We also know that the, the studies coming out right now from the EPA show no yield benefits for soy. Answer. So we're also reviewing the efficacy of both these on corn and soy. Well, they're effective on others, uh, and there will be PMR. Uh, studies coming out from the federal government, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. in the very near future, which we look forward to. question, the member from Essex. Okay, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, in 2006, the government approved the four-laning of Highway 3 from Windsor to Leamington and promised that the entire project would be completed by this year. The government got most of this project done, but the last phase from Essex to Leamington is still incomplete. In 2013, we were told that shovels would be in the ground by 2018, but late last year, we found that the government is rebuilding this section of Highway 3 without the four-laning. Minister, does this mean that the government intends on ripping up the road, repaving it, and then ripping it up again in 2018? for the four-laning, or has the government decided to postpone the highway, widening for another generation? You did it. Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thanks uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member from Essex for his question. He uh, he alluded to this in his uh, in his answer, uh, sorry, in his question, Speaker. But of course, uh, he would know that to date our government has invested nearly 50 million dollars to widen the 13 kilometers of the highway from the city of Windsor to the town of Essex. <clears throat> And he would also know, Speaker, that the work to widen the remaining two-lane section of Highway 3 between Leamington and Windsor is listed as part of our Southern Highways program under planning for the future, Speaker. But you know what I what I certainly think I find remarkable when I hear questions like this coming from members of the NDP caucus, Speaker, it's that day after day in this chamber, week after week, for as long as I've served as a member of Parliament representing Vaughan, Speaker. That member and that party have consistently voted against every single budget measure Shame. that will help us invest in transportation Answer. infrastructure. They fought us every step of the way, Speaker. It's a shame that they don't want to put their money, our money, where their mouths are. Thank you. I, I thank you very. I thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my predecessor, uh, as the member of Essex, the late Bruce Crozier, called the four-laning of Highway 3 uh, his one of his greatest accomplishments. And Speaker, it was one of many of his accomplishments. I respected him a lot. He knew that this highway was a vital link for our economy, especially the expanding greenhouse industry, and for the safety of drivers. When he died in 2011, the highway was aptly named the Bruce Crozier Way. Will this government finish what Bruce started and commit to the four-laning of the Bruce Crozier Way from Essex to Leamington in the, in the next update of the government's five-year Southern Highways program? Thank you. Minister? Thank you much, Speaker. I didn't get a chance to say in my initial answer. In 2014-15, this government, under the leadership of Premier Kathleen Wynne, is investing almost $2.5 billion to expand and repair Ontario's highways and roads and bridges, Speaker. But again, Speaker, what's remarkable, what's remarkable is that we are, we are dedicating this $2.5 billion to support highways and roads and bridges across the province of Ontario, including in southwestern Ontario, as part of our budget, both Budget 2014 and Budget 2015, Speaker. And the people living in Essex need to know, as I know they do, that that member in 2014 and again in 2015, I assume, I presume, given the tenor of the debate that you've brought forward so far, will also reject this budget, Speaker. Shame. It's a shame. Thanks very much. 
member from Halliburton Quarrel Lakes, Brock, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to introduce uh, my guests uh, this morning: Darren Meek, Kathleen Meek, and Taylor Meek from Prince Edward Meek. Island, Meek. and brought to Queens Park by her co their cousin Amanda Meek, oh. who used to be a former Queens Park Welcome to Queens Park. Welcome. Member from here on Bruce. Point of order, Speaker. I'd also like to welcome Mike, Mark Sherdown, Tyler Thompson, and Quinton Herbal. They've travelled from here in Perth area to Queens Park for the Youth Civics Day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emily Gore Malton, on the point of order. Speaker, I ask all members of this house to join me in welcoming Shalini Inham and Martin Inham, parents of the Olaf interim in my office, Justin Cordano Medeiros. Thank you, and please welcome them to the house. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to add to my colleague from uh, Kortha Lake. Uh, Amanda Meek and her family are here to raise funds for Walk So Kids Can Talk fundraiser in memory of her cousin, Chalice. Best of Thank luck. You. We have a deferred vote on the motion of second reading of Bill 91, an act to implement budget measures and an act to amend various acts. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? All members please take their seats. On April the 30th, uh, 2015, Mr. Souza moved second reading of Bill 91. All those in favour of the motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mrs. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassen. Ms. Jassen. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 51, the nays are 41. The ayes being 51 and the nays being 41, I declare the motion carried. Pursuant to the order of the House dated May 13, 2015, the bill is ordered referred to the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. Before we recess, I would like to uh, offer to all of the members a safe and uh, restful break, but I know that all of you do have other work in your riding, and that continues day to day, and I appreciate the work that you do. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.